I'm Jerry Hatfield. I'm a retired lab director from the National Lab for Agriculture and Environment. And basically what I work on is how can we make agriculture more resilient to the climate extremes that are going on. What I want to talk about is the future challenges in agriculture, uh, how we're going to have to produce more food, we have to produce it more efficiently, we're going to have to produce it in light of all the climate variation that's going on, and we're going to have to improve the quality of that food that we produce. Well, it's important because uh, we all want to eat, <laughs> and we need to have this abundant food supply, but in reality, what we really need to be thinking about is increasing the efficiency of agriculture. Uh, what do we produce relative to the amount of nutrients that we use, the amount of water that we use, because uh, that really begins to build a platform of how do we sustain agriculture into the future. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to uh, come to uh, beautiful Bismarck and you didn't arrange for a blizzard while I was here anyway. So I have retired from USDA, but I haven't retired from agriculture. Um, and so my wife wonders if I've really ever retired because I've been on the road last week speaking and I've got the next four weeks uh, where I'm speaking somewhere. So, but we are going to talk about this and if you look back at the program as we first started this overall effort in terms of looking at um, where agriculture is going uh, and all of this with Ted as he talked about where General Mills was at, a number of different things that are part of this overall process. And so, We've heard throughout this whole thing, uh, this whole conference, and I have to congratulate the organizers for, for putting this together because it is great to see uh, this amount of enthusiasm relative to looking at agriculture and what we can do in this because it is my belief that we are on the cusp of the next agricultural revolution. Uh, we're on a cusp of a regular of a revolution because of we've had the green revolution, but we're going to have what I would maybe call a knowledge revolution or a technological revolution, uh, maybe an awareness revolution of all these different things that agriculture will move forward in a different way. And so I'm going to give you the, one of the taglines that I use uh, with producers around the, the United States and that farming is not rocket science. Farming is much more complex. <laughs> because in rocket science, all you really need to know is the payload. We know what the force of gravity is, and from that you compute the thrust to get that rocket up in the air. Farming is like trying to solve six or seven simultaneous differential equations. Because we're trying to optimize a biological system in which we don't understand the interactions. And in spite of one candidate's <laughs> view of agriculture, it is not as simple as putting seed in the ground, putting a little more dirt on top of it, and watering it. I do have a Twitter handle. I could not resist, I, I resisted from sending out a Twitter response of the idiocy of that statement. But I do have a little discretion now and then, so I decided not to do that yet. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw these challenges out for you as, as we begin in this, and I'm going to look at these challenges uh, from a different perspective and, and begin to draw these out for you, is these challenges are really to increase the quantity and quality of production. We've heard this from Fred, we've heard it from a number of different things. It, it's not only about how much we produce, but the quality of that. We are going to have to reduce the environmental impact of agriculture, whether it be water quality, greenhouse gases, the soil runoff, a number of different things. We also are going to have to eliminate the degradation of our natural resources. We have a soil resource that we need to preserve as well. And we're going to have to cope with climate variation. Those four challenges should make all of you run screaming out of this room. Because they are big challenges. But I am extremely optimistic that we can address each one of those as we go along. And I'm just going to put it in this perspective for you. Here is a couple of different graphs that we use, the one on the left 
is this need for food production as we go forward as we put 10 billion people on the earth by 2050 and everybody talks about feeding the world at 2050. In reality, we need to think about how we're gonna feed the world at 2051. Uh, as well. And so when we think about this and you look at the shapes of those curves is that we really have a push to produce as much food in the next 50 years and actually just 30 years now as we've produced in the last 1500. But that curve on the right is worldwide land availability. Is that we're constantly reducing the amount of land that which we have to produce that food. If you just think about that, if we're going to increase food production on one hand, we're going to reduce the soil resource on the other hand, means that the production per unit area has got to dramatically increase. So we are going to have to become more efficient in what we produce on each unit of land out there. And so these challenges could be restated this way, is that we have an increasing population and demand for food, we have a decreasing land area and degradation of the soil resource. And what we really need as a challenge is to understand what limits productivity. If we're going to break through this barrier of productivity, we've got to understand what limits it to start with. And how do we begin to overcome that? Because you can only change what you understand. As we begin to look at this from a different perspective, it really draws it into this aspect. A number of years ago, we introduced this concept that we call G by E by M, genetics by environment by management. And it was only to tick off all my genetics friends that only work on the genetics by environment uh, piece of this. And the reason for that was that if we think about G by E by M, it's really this way, is that M is for management, which we oversee. E is what we're trying to overcome, whether it be soil variation or climate variation or weather variation, because genetics is what we're trying to optimize. We're trying to get the most out of every genetic resource that we have. And so you think about this from a different perspective is that we apply management to overcome all that soil variation that's out there or the weather variation that's out there because we want to get the most out of that crop that we put out there. And so when we begin to look at this G by E by M complex, it really has become a useful parameter and a useful metric of how we can begin to understand the dynamics of farming systems. And so in this quest to understand how we begin to do this, I'm going to take you through a couple different little scenarios. Because I've spent a lot of time looking at yield gaps. And yield gaps are basically this, is that we have a potential yield in all our genetics out there. Potential yield on corn, roughly 600 bushels. You see this last year in the yield contest is 612. We need to restate that, the fact that maybe we have a little bit more than 600 now in terms of that genetic potential. We have, an, that's a genetic specific thing, and if you look at attainable yield, which gets a little bit more realistic, is what that germplasm potential is under optimum weather and management inputs for a specific location. It's a much more usable term from that standpoint. And then we get down to farmer yield. And that difference between the attainable yield and farmer yield is the yield gap. And I often liken this to CSI agronomy. And really it's thinking about the fact that if you watch the CSI shows, there's always somebody dead, right? <laughs> There's always somebody did in there. One of the main characters in all of that is the mortician that tries to figure out really what's going on. In reality, that's what agronomists do. We determine how and why that plant died and why we didn't get the yield that we want. And we're going to have to ask that question even more in terms of saying, why don't we have the yield potential that we want? What limited it? And so if you look at the yield gaps, they are CSI agronomy. They're basically saying that we can analyze these yield gaps and begin to understand that where we begin to fail in terms of our dynamics of uh, our production. So this interest in yield gaps, and we spent a lot of time looking at this from many different perspectives, is that it gives us a metric 
on what we're progressing in terms of increasing productivity. It gives us a metric where we're failing to increase productivity as well. And it gives us a metrics at determining what factors limit yield, what's really limiting our genetic potential out there. And so when we look at this and we look around the world and all of this is that we're closing the yield gap a little bit on wheat, we're closing it on rice, corn, soybeans, pulses, we're nearly not closing yield gap at all. And so haven't made much progress there, but you also look at what we've invested in terms of resources into that crop, it's relatively small. So a lot of this is relative to the investment that's made in terms of genetics, agronomics, a number of different pieces. So you can see all these different things, but that yield gap on a worldwide basis is about 50% on wheat. It's about 36% in, in corn. Uh, it's about 96% if we look at corn in China. Very low yields in lots of different places. Uh, rice, soybeans, all those different crops that are going on. So we spent a lot of time looking at this Full disclosure, I have a statistics minor on my PhD, so I spent a lot of time just noodling with data. I did have an economics course uh, when I was doing my statistics. I really did learn how to lie with statistics uh, in, in that economic and econometrics courses as well, so I can analyze data in lots of different perspectives. That's also got me in trouble uh, in different ways. But if we look at yield gaps, and this is just wheat for the United States as a whole, that dash line on top is attainable yield. If you look at our yield gap is that we have been closing that across the nation uh, in all of this. Well, we did a little different analysis and just looked across the Great Plains. Uh, we went all the way from Oklahoma to Kansas to, to North Dakota in terms of wheat yields because what we were looking at is what caused that yield gap. And what we do in all of these analyses is that we actually relate the yield gap to uh, different climate variables. We've related to soil variables, depending on what our detail analysis is. But what we found when we start looking at those yield gaps on wheat across the Great Plains is that these yield gaps were related to rainfall during the grain filling period. Temperature is really not much of an impact on wheat unless we get a frost that occurs so infrequently at times it is hard to pull it out of the data set. But what, weather and, and availability of water is always one of the things that's there. And so we find that the yield gap in wheat is really related to availability of moisture during that grain filling period. That's the primary factor that's there. And so if we think about these dynamics is that improving our water availability and water storage during that time pays dividends in terms of closing that yield gap. And so we've even done a deeper analysis on wheat uh, throughout this is for the World Wheat Congress. Yield gaps in China is about 12%, India is about 4%, Germany, uh, actually that's zero, it, it comes out negative one. Australia is about 24% of yield gap, and again, if you think about wheat production in Australia, it's one of the harshest climates in which we grow wheat uh, as well. But here was a more stelling, telling thing in all of this, and this was the slope of how we were changing the actual yield increase versus the actual attainable yield. That upper line on that statistical dynamic versus the actual uh, mean yield is that we're actually increasing our attainable yields much faster than we're increasing their actual yield trends. To me, which is very encouraging, it says that in the absence of weather variation and in the presence of really good technology, that we are able to increase our yields faster than the yield trends that are out there. It says if we can continue to close that yield gap, we have every bit of capability of addressing the world food needs as we go forward. So we begin to think about these from different perspectives and all of this, and you begin to look at this dynamic and all of this, it really becomes a very fascinating thing. And we've done this for corn, we've done it for beans, we've done it for wheat. Uh, we've done some of the things in terms of other crops as we've gotten data as, as people have wanted all these different dynamics that are going on. But we find out that there are three different things that cause these yield gaps. Water stress during the grain filling period is the number one factor that causes yield gaps. This lack of water, rain-fed conditions, uh, 
really do exacerbate that in terms of this and this variability of weather causes that. The other piece is that we see as we start going through these data is high temperature during pollination. These high temperature events, when we're talking about 90 degrees, 95 degrees Fahrenheit uh, during the pollination, particularly on corn and soybeans, does really impact the pollination. Uh, we've run experiments and we've, we've, we've taken the pollination temperature or corn plant exposure to temperatures during pollination to above 100 degrees during pollination phase. And I can tell you that we have zero yield out of those because we basically desiccate all the pollen. The other one is, it's more interesting, is high temperatures during the grain filling period, high minimum temperatures. Because one of the pieces that is occurring in our climate trends is that we're not increasing our maximums, we're actually increasing our minimums. And so as we increase our minimums, even though we don't change the maximums, our average temperature going up. But high minimum temperatures have a tremendous impact on the metabolic processes of all living organisms. High nighttime temperature exposure, to cattle, take them off feed, to chickens, take them off feed, hogs, take them off feed, if they're exposed to high nighttime temperatures and high stresses, uh, can end up with mortality. Uh, we see the same thing in terms of crops, is that we basically, when exposing the high minimum temperatures, increase their respiration at night, and what we end up with is we respire all that photosynthate that we took from the previous day back into the air at night. And we've seen that when we begin to do that, it hastens senescence, changes all this in which we reduce the efficiency of the gearing filling process. And so we need to be aware that as we look at this changing climate is that the minimum temperatures are something that we can't ignore in terms of these dynamics. So we've been looking at screening varieties, a lot of these different things. We do put plants through a lot of torture chambers uh, in which we expose them to all these different things that are going on. So the largest limitation to production that we found in all of this as we go through different yield gaps is available water at critical periods of plant growth. And that actually is too much and too little, is we can have too much water. One of the things that we see across the Midwest is that excessive moisture in the early spring actually does limit yield. Too little water also limits yield. And we're seeing in many different mechanisms on that. Because that limits emergence, uh, we cause poor stands. We see it particularly in these wet springs that we have. We have either slowing down our planting rate, uh, we've got excess water in that, so we limit oxygen coming out of it. Uh, the other one is during the grain filling period, any stresses basically creates an inefficient conversion of sunlight. All of you are in the sunlight harvesting business. Anytime you're growing a crop, you're harvesting sunlight. And anything that limits that efficiency limits that ability to convert sunlight into carbohydrates. So we need to think about it from that standpoint. But the other piece of this puzzle when we think about it and our challenges in the future is really this one, a soil degradation. We start looking across the United States and we look across the world, soil degradation is one of those reasons that available land area is going down in terms of its capability of producing a crop. And during this last spring, the UN repeated through the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, reduced this report in terms of climate and land degradation. Land degradation is this negative trend in land condition. And climate change exacerbates that rate and magnitude of several ongoing degradation processes. It's a fancy way of saying that without adequate protection, what we're seeing is more and more erosion, both from water and wind, that are degrading our soil resource. And we're seeing that on a worldwide basis. We're eroding topsoil, we're eroding all this, either by wind or water as we go on there. In the 2014 National Climate Assessment was the first time that soil resource was put into the National Climate Assessment. We called attention to the fact that as the United States, we need to really think about how we preserve 
our soil resource as we go forward because we continue to have erosion. Uh, we continue to lose soil down rivers, down streams, off-site that are threatening our ability to produce a crop. And we look at this, and I, I built this a long time ago, the soil degradation spiral. What we see is that as we have poor land management, the first thing that begins to change in there is we begin to destroy the ability of those aggregates uh, to remain as a stable aggregate. And that leads us to compaction, it leads to crusting. We end up with water and wind erosion. As we erode that soil, reduce our plant growth, we reduce plant growth, we reduce the ability to feed the, the soil biology, and then pretty soon our yields go down, and we wonder where our soil productivity went. And we see that increasing variation across fields. We see that increasing variation across uh, all the landscapes as we look at in terms of these dynamics. And so part of this agricultural revolution is going to be how do we restore the productivity of that soil? How do we begin to do this? We have a similar thing. Mark talked about this uh, with the LTAR sites. We have a similar LTAR site in, in Iowa. And, and we've been measuring carbon dioxide exchanges across corn and soybeans uh, for almost 28 years now. Uh, so we have a fairly long data set on corn and soybeans. Uh, we analyzed that and began to look at the carbon balance using these eddy flux towers. And we're finding that this typical corn soybean rotation uh, system, maybe a deep rip or some sort of uh, tillage operation in the fall, field cultivation in the spring, uh, no residue removal in all of this, is losing 1,000 pounds of carbon per acre per year. And when we first presented that, people said, well, we really don't trust your flux tower measurements in terms of all this. So we have lots of availability of data. We actually sampled this field in 2006 at a grid. We sampled it again in 2016 uh, with a grid over that 10-year period. These grids are 150 feet by 150 feet down to a depth of four and a half feet. Uh, and so we looked at the carbon loss using those soil data versus the, uh, the flux tower data. Those numbers are at the bottom, minus 170, those are megagrams per, of carbon versus minus 172. They're basically the same numbers whether we did the flux towers or we did the soil measurements. We are continually degrading our soil resource by what we consider to be an acceptable practice across the Midwest. We cannot continue to do that. We're gonna to have to think about changing these dynamics. You can tell how popular I am in some circles in terms of these dynamics. But I'm also retired. So these current cropping systems out there that we're losing carbon at the rate of 1,000 pounds of carbon, it means if you farm 40 years, you've lost 20 tons of carbon out of that soil. That's a pretty big amount of carbon. And so what we consider is proper land management is slowly degrading our soils. It really does come through in terms of these dynamics that we need to understand. And one of the big challenges, and I have to applaud you for the fact of really thinking about how do you move forward in terms of enhancing that soil resource, protecting that soil resource, adding carbon back to that soil resource, because that is the future of agriculture, is how do we manage our system differently. Here's just another little analysis we did. Uh, we took data from uh, Kentucky, Iowa, and Nebraska, and we just looked at the average county yields, and we selected about 40 counties out of each one of those states. We plotted it against an index that NRCS has in their database, the National Crop Commodity Productivity Index. Uh, nobody uses that, but it's a pretty good index uh, in terms of looking at the capability of that soil to produce corn or, or soybeans. And we plotted that average county yield for 40 years of data relative to NCCPI. And it's kind of a duh graph. The better the soil, the higher the yields. And so when you look at this, you see that across the Midwest is that we have good soils and, and, and as we move the Corn Belt in north into Minnesota is we're gonna move it into really high quality soils. 
And so we look at all these different dynamics that are going on. Oh, I should come back to the point of, and everybody always asks what's wrong with Nebraska. That's those triangles at the top. It's not the fact that Nebraska knows how to grow soybeans any better than Iowa or anybody else. It's a fact that we only selected counties in Nebraska that were irrigated. Bottom line is if you can control the water, <laughs> the quality of the soil doesn't make any difference. But if you're dependent upon rainfall, the quality of the soil is everything. And we need to understand that, going back to that wheat example, that water availability during that grain filling period is dependent upon what soils we have and how we can store that water. You look at all this, more and more, and I have oodles of these pictures. These are typical scenes across the Midwest. These just happen to be from Iowa. I have erosion going off, and we're seeing a lot of erosion that are way in excess of what is tolerable soil loss. So it brings me to this point of how we begin to think about improving our soils as well. And we've heard this, a number of different speakers, and particularly from the producers of how the soil has changed. In fact, Greg gave you a perfect example in this last thing of just how critical that soil armor is in terms of protecting that soil resource. And so we think about, and I built this little diagram that basically says how we build soil up begins with one piece, is being able to restore the biological activity within that soil. That's the first rung on this ladder as we think about aggregating it. And soil, want, uh, soil biology wants four things. It wants food, water, air, and shelter. What do you want? Food, water, air, and shelter. So we've got to feed it. We've got to protect it. We've got to water it. You know, think about this. If the lunch you ate was the last lunch you were going to eat for the next six months, You'd have probably gone back for those seconds that Daryl said were there, right? <laughs> we never really think about what it takes to maintain the biological population within the soil. How do we begin to look at this? You think about these different pillars of soil health in terms of providing that food, providing that armor, that's the home, minimally disturbing it because nobody likes to, you know, how many people love to have their furniture rearranged in their house by their wife all the time? <laughs> Not picking on you wives. Sometimes husbands rearrange furniture as well as wives. Is that that disrupts our life and the same thing happens when we begin to put biology out there and we till it as we disrupt their habitat. And they, they basically give up. So it's a little cartoon that we put together. Basically, if you've, on the left side, if you've got an unstable aggregate, as soon as that raindrop begins to hit it, is it begins to dissolve into sand, silt, and clay. And as it moves down through that, it plugs all those pores. As it plugs the pores, we no longer have room for that water to move down through, and we end up with runoff. And in fact, there are a lot of soils across the United States, particularly in the Midwest, in which we have less than a half inch of infiltration per hour. If you get a two inch rain in an hour, and you've got a half inch infiltration rate, means that you really only had a half inch of rain. So I never always ask producers, don't tell me how much rain you got in the rain gauge, tell me how much rain you got in the soil. Because that's the true metric of what we have in terms of our soil. If we have a high biological activity soil, stable aggregates out there where they're very resistant to rainfall, Adding that cover on crop also reduces that raindrop energy so they remain stable and we can continue to move water into that. I can store water within the soil if I can get it into the soil. And so getting and how we manage water is going to be our number one issue that we face with climate is water management. How do we keep it? How do we preserve it? all these different things. Just to give you another little change as we, we had another field that we changed because of this result of this reducing carbon content in there was we took a field in 2016 and we put the same towers over it, but we converted that field to a no-till cover crop system. 
we sampled it to the same 150 foot by 150 foot grid uh, and again down to four and a half feet. We divide each of those cores into six inch segments and then we divide each of those six inch segments into seven different size fractions. And all that tells you is I keep a lot of students busy sifting soil because we do understand how water is impacting that. But two things happen as we begin to change and transition that field from a conventional till to a to cover crop no-till field is that within two years we doubled the microbial biomass in that upper six inches of that soil profile. And the data that came in from 2018 and then from 2019, so we've been sampling that field at the same grid every fall, is that from 2018 to 2019, we doubled that microbial biomass again. So we can change it, and we went from a negative carbon balance to a positive carbon balance within one year after we quit tilling. Quit tilling. So we can change fields very rapidly. We can change this in lots of different ways. So in all of this, we've got this changing precipitation regime, just to add a little backdrop to this coping with climate, is that we have an increase in annual precipitation. We see that across it. We're shifting to more spring rainfall. We're shifting also to more ra fall rainfall as well. So we're kind of changing the whole dynamic of this. We have reduced summer rainfall with increasing variability out there. And we have an increase in extreme precipitation events. The whole precipitation regime is changing. And we're going to figure out how we manage water and all of this. This just happens to be the extreme events uh, graph across there. And you can see that in the past few years, we get more and more extreme events. So what I have to ask you is, what's your field look like after a two-inch heavy rain? Because if you go out into your field and look after a two-inch heavy rain and you see little rivulets running off, is that you don't have soil health. You don't have the capacity of absorbing that water. You can look at that very simply and see what's going on. But here's how we need to start thinking about agriculture. Fred talked about his journey as, as he's gone along. I've got a similar one in terms of these dynamics, is that we need to start looking at agriculture in ecological context. So my whole desire in building this graph was to build something that nobody could take apart and work and say, I worked on this particular part. I'd had to make it so complex. And so some people refer to this as my Mickey Mouse diagram because of the the ears on each side. But uh, often we thought about agriculture from the provisioning side, that upper left-hand corner, how much we produce. But in reality, the agriculture is also in terms of the regulating side, what we do with water quality, air quality, what we do with all the disease and insect populations that are out there, what we do in terms of supporting in terms of an ecosystem service, in terms of pollination or nutrient cycling, and then the cultural aspects. What are we doing in terms of the societal view of agriculture in our landscape out there. And so we need to start looking at this, and you begin to look at the, how well we have the systems, we've got temporal dynamics, we've got spatial dynamics, all wrapped around this ecosystem. So we've been looking at how does all this fit together. And so really beginning to look at it in a much more holistic approach as we go across. And so what's becoming very, became very fascinating to me is what we've done across the United States. And if you look at the NAS maps of uh, corn and soybean production, you notice that we've moved a lot of production of corn and soybeans into North Dakota and South Dakota. They are as intense in corn and soybeans as any county in Iowa, Illinois, and all of this. So we, we got very fascinated with this. So we went through and did some dynamics in just the eastern third of the cropping districts of both of the states. And if you look at the, the lines up there, the green lines are other crops. That's canola, sunflowers, wheat, hay, and all of this. The uh, purple line is corn, and the gold line is soybeans. We haven't moved the corn belt, because we really haven't changed corn production that much, but we just really moved soybeans into you guys. <laughs> and you look at this, and you move the soybean production area up and everything, and he, we did a further analysis in all of this, and see these changes that are going on, is that we came up and we found that there are five factors that drove this overall change. We had environment, because there's longer growing season, there was increasing precipitation, management that went with that, there was more no-till, residue management cover crops uh, that allowed all of this to occur. Uh, Post-harvest, high market prices, high demand uh, for these crops uh, as well. Uh, social values, uh, 
larger farm size, renter management, all these different things that were there, and genetics uh, increase in short season varieties, cold and uh, drought tolerance of this, herbicide resistance. Uh, Greg mentioned Roundup Ready soybeans. Uh, you know, we've, we've made it fairly easy in terms of a lot of this. One farmer once told me, I'll give you this little piece, he said, you know, when you develop technology, it should be as easy as Roundup Ready soybeans. And I go, what are you talking about? He said, all we had to do with Roundup Ready soybeans is open a different bag of seed. Didn't have to change your planter. Didn't have to do any things. It just has to be as simple as opening a different bag of seed. You know, that's bugged me for 15 years of how we built technology as simple as opening a different bag of seed. But that's the way we got to think about it as we go forward. So we see this uh, simplification of crop diversity. Uh, and actually, in these eastern third of these cropping districts in North Dakota and South Dakota, we've seen a couple different things happen. We've seen increased flashiness of streams as we've begun to look at the stream flow records. We've seen increasing runoff. I've seen a decrease in pollinator habitat. These are not necessarily positives, but they are a fact that I think we have to deal with in terms of looking at our landscape and saying, if we move these things, what will happen? And how can we avoid some of the negative consequences with it? Because we do need diversity on the landscape for all the ecosystem services. We're going to see some of those decline uh, across this. We're going to see a continued decrease in soil organic matter. Uh, that basically what that means is we increase the reliance on inputs and you get increased vulnerability to weather variation. We do have water quality impacts and we have soil quality impacts. I'll give you one example and this just happens to be from the Raccoon River uh, in, in Iowa. Graph on the left is the nitrate concentrations. You realize that Des Moines has the world's largest nitrate removal system because they've got to treat the water in order to meet drinking water standards. And so we were asked to do an analysis of really what these trends were looking like in the nitrates. So we did all sorts of things in terms of looking at increasing nitrogen fertilizer into the watershed, increasing manure into the watershed, all these different things. The only thing that was related to this change in nitrate is this graph on the right in which we showed that this decreasing amount of small grains and hay across the watershed is once we drop below 10%, the nitrate started to increase within the watershed. There was no impact of, of changing nitrogen fertilizers, no impact of changing animal populations, all these different things. It was simply the fact that we decreased the diversity across that watershed that led to the nitrate changes. Those are pretty stark in terms of thinking about the consequences and the impacts that we have because of what we think are simple changes in agriculture. And we see this across that we look at tile drainage, we look at all this. So here's some opportunities I think we have in the Midwest. And you've seen this in, in throughout this whole conference, is we have the potential to go different crops. I mean, 20 different crops uh, on a farm. That's pretty remarkable in terms of the dynamics. We have to start looking, looking beyond just provisioning, but consider the broader, view of agri broader ecological view of agriculture. Because this diverse rotations, and I think Greg will tell you, Morgan will tell you, all of this, any producer will tell you that this diversity of rotation allows you to cope with the weather variation that's going on. They spread risk from a different perspective because expect increasing variability of weather uh, as we go forward. We have to think about it from this perspective, is that if we think about our agricultural system contributing to human well-being, right now we exist in that bottom graph on the right. It takes little to take the system out of balance. But we need to think about having a system in which they're equally supported, that we're not favoring one ecosystem over the other in terms of these ecosystem service over the other and all of this. So we're going to have to start considering what the ecological view of the landscape is rather than just the provisioning view. You start thinking about habitat. You think about all these different things that are going on. So here's the future directions that I think we need to consider and at least have a dialogue about them. We have to consider that agriculture exists as part of the overall ecosystem. 
and we have to view agriculture as having multiple ecosystem values. NRCS, a number of years ago, developed the whole swap of concept, soil, water, animal, plant, air, and human, SWAPA plus H, is that we really take a need to re-examine that and really begin to take those different endpoints to heart much more than we have. We also need to consider the efficiency views of agriculture rather than only yield. Efficiency in terms of utilizing our natural resources. How much water do we use to produce that crop? How much carbon do we use to produce that crop? How much nutrient do we use to produce that crop? Greg just showed you that he found out that maybe he didn't need as much nitrogen out there. When we begin to restore the soil, it begins to do a lot for us in terms of these dynamics. And we really need to rediscover our value of natural resources and how to protect them. Hugh Hammond Bennett called attention to the conservation of our natural resources a long time ago. Maybe it's time to rediscover that we need to have a voice that stands up for our natural resources. But not only stands up for our natural resources, but stands up for our agricultural resources and saying, we are an agricultural system and we need to protect it because of these reasons. Not only feeding people, but what we do for the rest of the ecosystem. What we do in terms of the well-being of all of us as a human race. And I think we need to rediscover those particular attributes and how we begin to think about agriculture in the context of what we are as a society. That our role is not just to produce food. Our role is much broader than that. And I think we need to be explaining that to the individuals. And so, I appreciate the opportunity to come and share this with you. You may not agree with everything I said, but that's, that's, that's life. <laughs> I don't get paid to have people agree with me. I get paid absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> you know? I'm really trying to figure out how to get $100,000 a speech. That's really what I'm trying to figure out to do. Because then I figure I can give two or three a year, be done with it, and play golf the other 375 days, 365 days a year, because I can give that speech in an hour and hit the golf course by noon. So, you know, my goal in agriculture from now on is to make audiences like you ask questions, but also re-examine what you're trying to do and prod and poke and basically raise your consciousness that we have great opportunities in agriculture and let's not waste them. So with that, thank you. <laughs>